the future. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. It is I, Dankard Lexicon, and welcome to another edition of the Steampunk Beginner's Guide. Today, we'll be talking about a subject we announced a long time ago. After talking about technology and characters in fiction, we have come to the subject of world building. The word world building, however, is a bit deceiving. You see, the act of making up a world and world building are not necessarily the same thing. Now, making up a fictional world is one thing. There are entire groups dedicated to making up worlds, complete with geography, history, cultures, just everything. It is called fictional geography, geofiction, or confiction. It is a very popular activity for gamers, role players, and writers alike, but to build a world with all its complex systems is a different discipline than the world building that happens within a story. If every line of text a writer is describing how and where events take place within the narrative, in other words, a writer is always world building even if they are not aware of it. Especially in fiction, the writer informs the reader of the various aspects of the world, be it a location or how characters move from one locale to the other. Good world building does not necessarily entail making up complex worlds or interesting locales. The challenge is to bring this in a thought-provoking and entertaining way. Now, the rule being show don't tell, it's very important not to expose your audience to an excessive amount of exposition. Now, here's already one quick tip in how to prevent that. Background stories suck! There is a common misconception that a world is a place with a history, some cultures, and in case of steampunk, spiffy gadgets such as airships. That is a misunderstanding. You see, a world can be all of those things. However, in terms of narrative, a world is a place where stuff happens. We just happen to call that stuff stories. We are not here to write tourist guides. We are writing stories that people are interested in, and those stories require narratives. So world is not just a physical place, it is a space where characters live. And with characters, I don't mean nations or species, I mean individuals with agency who make events happen. You see, this is where a lot of would-be writers go wrong when exposing the audience to the world for the first time. They often tend to lack the characters from which we're going to experience the world. Let's look at two movies both co-directed and produced by Clint Eastwood and Steven Spielberg. Letters from Iwo Jima and Flags of Our Fathers. Both contain events that happened during the same time, the same battle, and on the same island. So that would mean we only need to create one world, right? Wrong. Let's analyze two of these film settings, shall we? In Flag of Our Fathers, Marines get sent to an island where they need to charge an unknown beach from amphibious assault boats, with countless unseen enemies laying in waiting, ready to unleash a hail of fire. The first wave of marines storm the beach unopposed. Maybe the enemy has already retreated into the mountains, but as more and more marines gather upon the beach, it is already too late. The Japanese were waiting for this to happen and unleash their fury upon the unsuspecting Americans who have nowhere to run. Marines die, ships get blown up, it is a massacre. Now, let's have a look at the same event in Letters from Iwo Jima. A soldier is digging holes, assuming he's going to die in one of these, as it's already very unlikely the Japanese Empire is going to win. Morale is low, and officers are on the hunt for anyone who dares to complain about their terrible predicament. And then the day arrives they've been anticipating for so long. After a long period of bombardment and an outbreak of dysentery, a huge fleet of assault boats appears on the horizon and they're heading for the beach. Soldiers are told to hold their fire as the enemy walks upon the beach. Soldiers are shaking in their dugouts as they see the approaching Americans for the first time in their lives, wondering why they're not allowed to fire their guns. Finally, the order to fire has been given. The soldiers see countless Americans die in the sand. But it is to no avail. Their positions get overrun, and the soldiers get to spend the last week of their lives 
in caves under heavy enemy fire. Same event, same location and time, yet two different worlds. One is the world of a soldier trying to survive a battle that was lost before it started, the other of soldiers who partake in the deceit on the home front to keep the war going. Now, we are going to talk on how to flesh out these worlds. There are two main approaches to world building, one being high concept, the other being low concept. Now, we talked about these topics in earlier videos, so I'm only going to talk about it in terms of world building. Low concept stories generally follow the structures of the so-called monomyth, as postulated in the hero's journey by Joseph Campbell. In these stories, the trials and tribulations of the protagonists take precedence, and the world hurls dilemmas and obstacles at them to overcome, so they can fulfill their quest. In practice, this means the world is shaped to facilitate the development of the characters in order for them to gain the strength they need to defeat the metaphorical dragon, take the princess, and liberate the treasure. Wait, I think you just- I KNOW WHAT I SAID! Anyway, most stories in the fantasy genre fall on the low concept. In high concept stories, an idea or concepts take priority. Even though characters have their own hero's journey, their adventures are tied to the ideas the writer wants to explore. These ideas could be what-if questions surrounding matters of politics, philosophy, technology, or the outcome of historical events. Most of science fiction, alternate history, and an extension steampunk are written as high concept. Now, there can be a thin line between high and low concept. For example, the Lord of the Rings trilogy is your archetypical fantasy story, with many references to the myths of yesteryear. Frodo wants to go on adventure. His wish gets granted when Bilbo gives him the Ring of Power, and the Ring Wraiths come after him. During his travels, he meets allies and makes adversaries. He also learns the ring is a far greater burden than he thinks he can handle, and asks Galadriel to take the ring in his place. Instead, Galadriel reveals to him what she'll become if she would accept the ring. The ring also informs his adversaries where the fellowship is at all time, and its power is seducing his allies. After Baromir dies, Frodo wants to go alone, because he doesn't want anyone else to carry his burden. But Sam goes with him anyway. Later we also see what Frodo would become if he keeps the ring when we meet Gollum. That doesn't mean there are no high concepts within Lord of the Rings. A matter of fact, the story explores quite a lot of them. Like the various cultures, languages, but these are all inferior to the main plot. It can actually be quite distracting, so when the movie adaptation was made, many of these ideas were tossed aside to make room for the narrative. Now, in high concept, however, we tend to get the opposite. Take the cyberpunk thriller Blade Runner. That starts with a very boring scene of a man taking a test at the police station. He's being checked whether he's a replicant or not. A very advanced android to perform labor humans can't or don't like to do, such as deep space mining, fighting, and particular forms of entertainment. The scene ends with the test giving a positive result, and the revealed replicant kicking all kinds of ass. Now we know what a replicant is, we learn about Blade Runners, represented by the character of Decker a specialist who hunts down rogue replicants with a license to shoot them without prejudice. This, of course, implies that these robots are less than human and therefore don't have the same rights as humans do. This in itself is not strange. We don't care about the faith of a dishwasher, after all. They're just machines that happen to look human. Dishwashers don't ask this question to their original creator. I want more life, fucker. That's right, only Roger Howard would dare to approach God and ask for more life. If there is a physical God, he probably choked him by now. We know this because he still has not been resurrected. He'll be missed. And what if they don't just want more time on this planet, but also value the memories of their experiences? Like most humans would. A matter of fact, replicants are so lifelike they often don't realize they're not human. After all, how can we prove we are human or not? And does that distinction allow us to treat the replicants any different? But wait, what about the plot of the film? 
Well, dear listeners, in high concert, it doesn't really matter whether the protagonists win or not. You see, the point of high concept is to explore ideas. That's why they can get away with bad endings. Rather, Agent Decker gets to throw the replicant into Mount Doom is beside the point. That is why high concept stories get away with having dark or negative outcomes. Oh, of course, you can throw in things for that coolness factor, or just because it sounds logical to be there. However, for a world to be memorable, it needs to be connected to a well-developed plot. This is what separates Avatar The Last Airbender, probably one of the best animated shows ever written, from its sequel series, Avatar Legend of Korra. In The Last Airbender, the various nations and their respective cultures represented their respective elements that the protagonists needed to master. In Korra, however, the future New York stuff is just style over substance nonsense with some cool ideas here and there, but after the first season, it is just aesthetic white noise with no relevance to the plot whatsoever. It is just like the game world of Dishonored where they have created a whole elaborate city with its own unique economy and technology, but settled on a typical revenge plot they effectively recycled from Neverwinter Nights as written by Alex Jones. Just to name a few wonderful settings completely wasted on low-concept stories written for the lowest common denominator. Case in point, worlds in fiction don't just contain locations and cultures with some history, you can't just dump background information on the reader and expect them to care. Be it readers or moviegoers, the audience sorts information in real time for relevance, so if a story just throws in dry facts at them, they immediately forget it because there is no narrative context. When world building, you need to think of characters or other representations of their respective societies and its values. Let's have a look at a well-known fictional character. Darth Vader. Darth Vader's role in the Star Wars franchise evolved in between the Star Wars films. Originally, in A New Hope, he was supposed to be the face of the Empire, a black-clad figure in between the faceless goons that make up the army. His connection to the protagonist was that of a former student of Obi-Wan Kenobi, who went rogue when he became corrupted by the dark side of the Force. The fact that he was a cyborg was just a symbol for his fall from grace and made him look more like a monster, just as his helmet was a reference to World War II German soldiers and a samurai to emphasize both his authoritarian and warrior nature. But during the pre-production of The Empire Strikes Back, it was decided that Darth Vader was Luke's father. Now, spoilers by the way. The importance of this change cannot be understated. In A New Hope, Darth Vader's presence was purely utilitarian with a minimal connection to the protagonist themselves. But by making Luke his son, he was suddenly more than just a villain. Darth Vader wasn't just an obstacle anymore. He represented what Luke fears to become. Fighting him wasn't just about good and evil. Luke needed to be better than him in more than one way and resist the temptations of the dark side. Darth Vader is an essential part in the world building. Through his scenes we learn about the Jedi, despite all the powers are but a leftover from a bygone age, how the Empire functions and about the dark side of the Force. Luke's victory over Darth Vader indicates Luke has resisted the dark side of the Force and that his journey is almost at an end. However, the final boss, the Emperor, turns out to be a big challenge for him. And when the Emperor has Luke on his knees, Darth Vader steps in, assaults the Emperor and throws him down a pit, saving his son. Not only does Luke forgive his father, it also tells us that there is some chance of redemption for horrible people. Now, that's a lot of talk on characters and their perspective. But what about worlds, you ask? What about cities, armies, nations? Well, treat them as if they are their own people with agency. To know what I'm talking about, go check out our episode on writing characters. Link will be down in the description. Just as Darth Vader was designed to be a space Nazi officer, parts of your world can be designed in the same way. It is all about show. Don't tell. Let's say you want to create an interplanetary empire that is ruled by a noble elite. 
You can show this by giving their leaders titles like Duke or Count that are hereditary. Their armed forces can have references to feudal armies such as soldiers called knights or have units be called lances. These are simple ways to communicate to the audience what this empire is like. Maybe there are nobles that rule through councils that elect emperor for life or elect a temporary dictator in times of war. Their costumes can reflect their functions. Now, these factions within the empire have main concerns they need to deal with, just like characters do. Maybe their colonies struggle with food shortages due to raiders. So the colonists themselves look emaciated and hopeless. There are long lines in front of stores or warehouses and guards keep the people in check or suppress food riots. Meanwhile, the noble councils bicker who's going to be the new emperor or maybe they're arguing whether a dictator should be appointed or not to deal with the raider threat. While the council is wasting their time arguing, local nobles or knights could be arranging their own plans because they've lost faith in the council. Now, I could go on and on and on, but from this basic description, we can think of characters that could represent the various aspects of this universe. A nobleman that wants to be elected dictator so he can save the empire, uh, rule it. A disillusioned knight trying to fight off the raiders, or squeeze the population for protection money. A desperate worker who's trying to feed his family. These characters may live in the same setting, each of them live in different worlds. Their dictator lives in a world of political intrigue, the knight in law enforcement or the army, and the worker in a deteriorating habitat dome. Because the worker doesn't care about high-tier politics, his story and world will be narrowed down because there's no point in distracting the audience with the inner workings of all the interstellar politics. That is the problem with the Star Wars prequel films. It wants to be a origin story that nobody asked for, a love story, a spy film, a political commentary and comedy all at the same time. A writer needs to narrow the scope to keep their story on track is what I'm trying to say. There's just so much to talk about when it comes to the topic of building worlds, communicating its details to the audience, and of course its themes. But you have to remember that this is a subject that many writers spend many years of their lives to master. However, if you have particular questions regarding this topic, please ask them down below in the comment section and maybe we'll include your questions in future videos. Now, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for me to bid you adieu, and as always, make things your way. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Bonsert. Thank you so much for watching the 12th episode of Steampunk Beginner's Guide. There are a couple of things I want to say. Let's start with thanking the people who support me on Patreon and Subscribestar, Bowlerhead Tom, CGB Spender, and Steamy Wonders. Thank you so much for your support. I want to thank Silver Allen, uh, a creator from Hong Kong, who has made the wonderful leather color I'm wearing in the video. Thank you so much for this gift. Now, if there's anyone else out there who wants to make something uh, for my channel, uh, please let me know. Gifts are always welcome. Uh, if you like a challenge, uh, please contact me because there are a number of things I want to create. That brings me to the next topic. If you are interested in uh, high concept ideas, on how to write them. We are now working on our own series of stories called the Association of Ishtar, which is kind of a steampunk take on the SCP concept. And of course, we'll make a promotional video for this as well on our second channel, the Retro Future Research Foundation. Subscribe to that as well if you haven't already. Uh, I intend to make a lore video next on that channel, see how that works out. So check those out if you do, and I'd love to have some feedback and also the ideas that people can contribute their own stories as well. So there's this... RPGs element to it and finally I made a little Rutger Hauer tribute for those who don't know him he's a Dutch actor who's in a lot of cyberpunk and steampunk films and a number of war movies as well so he's a bit of a hero of mine and he died last month unfortunately a bit late but I thought it was important I even had to reshoot the recordings because I screwed up the first takes of, of me ranting to the camera. So yeah check out our stories uh, go check out Alan's work I put a link down below and of course, comment, like, and subscribe, and as always, make things your way. Goodbye.